Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are going to take a look at the model of 1884 Kropotschek. This was a French production, basically an iteration on the 1878 Kropotschek that we took a look at last time. So once again, uh, briefly, I am doing this in conjunction with the Kickstarter pre-sale of my book, Chasse to FAMAS, French Military Rifles. 1866 to 2016, so if you're interested in this subject at all, you should definitely pause the video, go check out the Kickstarter, pick up a reduced price, cool, limited edition book, and then come back here and finish this. All right, now that you're back, we can carry on with this gorgeous example of Model 1884 Kropotschek. Uh, basically what's happened here is, in the intervening years, since the army adopted the single-shot Gras in 1874, and then the French Navy adopts the repeating Kropotschek in 1878, people's concerns, military staff officials' concerns about the, the viability and the wisdom of a repeating rifle had started to shift. So at the beginning of this time period there were some seemingly legitimate uh, objections to a repeating rifle. Things like, well, our gunpowder creates these huge clouds of smoke when it fires, and so what's the point in a repeating rifle? You have to let some of that smoke clear before you can even see where you're shooting. So let's save the money and let guys use that time when the smoke's clearing to just reload the rifle. No big deal. You're really, these people were, were theorizing that you wouldn't actually see a practical increase in the rate of fire with a repeating rifle anyway, so why bother with the cost? Um, and of course there were concerns about manufacturing cartridges, concerns about maintaining ammunition supply, about you know controlling troop discipline and rate of fire. Well, events on the ground, actual field use of these guns started to change people's minds. And one of the big events to do this was the Battle of Plevna in the Russo-Turkish War, 1877-1878. And what happened there, now I've seen some debate recently about what actually happened there, but as far as everyone at the time understood, what the military observers reported back is what happened was a force using Winchester repeating rifles just demolished a force using single shot rifles. Um, and that this idea, all these potential theorized problems of the repeating rifle were vastly insignificant compared to the amount of firepower that they could generate, and the, the effectiveness that that could have, how it could take a small force, multiply its effective firepower, and allow it to prevail over a larger force. So people start looking more seriously at a repeating rifle. Well, in the French military, the one, the perfect example on hand is the Kropotschek. The Navy has adopted it in 1878, they've gotten some field use with it, They're, you know, the Marines are using these things out in the colonies and it's working fairly well, uh, you know, a few little hiccups here and there. But um, during these years the head of the tool shop at the Châtellerault Ars Arsenal, a guy named Albert Kloss, uh, he's been working on that 1878 rifle, because if the French army is going to adopt a rifle they're not going to buy it from some foreign manufacturer like Steyr, like the navy did with this small batch of 1878s that they got. If, if the army is going to adopt this rifle it's going to be made in one of the French arsenals, or probably in several of the French arsenals. So in 1883 he presents his final development of basically copy and slight improvement of the 1878 Kropotschek uh, to the, min the uh, Ministry of War. And they rather like it. They go ahead and actually adopt it and put it into production in 1884. And it is this rifle. So let's take a closer look at this and let's see what he did uh, to change it from the 1878 Marine Kropotschek. We'll start with some markings here. This example was made at Manufacture des Hommes de Châtellerault. It's a model 1884. As you would expect on any French rifle like this, uh, we have a serial number here on the barrel. This has an A prefix because it was made by Châtellerault. Uh, the Saint-Tien ones will have an F prefix. Um, as usual, uh, Saint-Tien got numbers or got letters starting at F. Châtellerault had A, B, and C, or A, B, C, D, and E at this point. Uh, we have a rear sight still very much reminiscent of the Gras. Um, in fact, the official battle sight zero is flipped all the way forward like this, and then you have a uh, range that goes up to I believe 1900 meters. We have our production date here on the barrel, uh, Châtellerault barrel, 1884 production, MA for manufactured disarm. Then this example has just a gorgeous uh, roundel stamp still in it, identifying that this particular example was adopted into service in November of 1884. The action here is still fundamentally the same as 
the earlier Kropatschek, and really it's fundamentally the same that you would have on the Lebel, with a couple of little exceptions. So once we open the bolt we have a follower lifter there that's going to pop a cartridge up. When you close the bolt that lifter drops down, which allows a round to feed out of the tube magazine onto the lifter. Uh, this was the, the magazine tube was extended so that the 1884 has a capacity of eight rounds in the tube instead of seven on the earlier model. In fact if I bring out the 1878 you can see that here. The tube on this ends inside the stock, the tube on the 1884 extends a little bit farther, and it's just enough farther out to afford it one extra round of capacity. The 1884 also got itself a cleaning rod along the side of the stock. Of course it can't go center line under the barrel because that's where the magazine tube is. The 78 did not have a rod like this, and it was judged to be important enough to add on. While we're up here at the muzzle of the rifle I will point out that one of the weak points in the design overall, one of the things that they would beef up in the 1885, was this cutout right here tended to be a weak point and the stock tended to crack there. You needed that cutout because the bayonet mounted right up here, and you had to have a little bit of a relief to be able to get it back off. Uh, by the way, this bayonet was actually a standard Gras bayonet, where the 1878 had its own proprietary Steyr production bayonet. With the 1884 they wisely went back to using a model that they already had in large quantities. We still have a magazine cutoff here in the form of this little lever, so if I push that all the way forward the bolt no longer pushes the elevator down, in fact it's locked, uh, which means you can of course see the hole in the bolt here to sit over that little lever. So when I close the bolt the lever the elevator doesn't go down, which means it doesn't pull a cartridge out of the magazine. It's still in the upward position. So you would simply single feed the rifle in this configuration until you wanted to use the magazine. Then you pop that lever back, and the next time you close the bolt the elevator goes down and it's ready to uh, feed a new cartridge. One other change here, mostly stylistic, is a change in the design of the cocking piece. So the 1884 has two notches back there uh, for the sear. One's a safety catch, a half cock notch so to speak, and the other is your regular firing catch, where the Kropatschek actually had four of them in there. So that was, that was deemed a little bit unnecessary, and the overall profile of the cocking piece was changed as well. But most of these things are just little stylistic uh, minor differences. Uh, fundamentally the 78 and the 84 work the same way, just the 84 has been uh, optimized for French arsenal production. So 1884 this thing goes into production, they tool up for it at both Saint-Étienne and Châtellerault. Saint-Étienne would make 50,830 of these rifles, Châtellerault would make somewhere between 33 and 35,000 of them, so that's not trivial, like that's serious large-scale production, and they're ramping up to, uh, you know, to issue these things out to a lot of forces. This is going to be a standard infantry rifle. Well, two things happen. First off, there's some small problems with it that require some revision, and there would actually be an 1885 pattern that would take over from this. But more importantly, in 1886 smokeless powder is invented by a French chemist named, Al named uh, Paul Viel. And that completely revolutionizes military small arms, and it literally makes these rifles obsolete overnight. And that would lead to the development of the Lebel. And we'll talk about the, the early development of the Lebel in a separate video, but basically it's this thing, or it's the 1885 version of it, uh, modified, scaled down to 8mm, um, or necked down to 8mm. But where this left the 1884s was in kind of a kind of limbo. Um, these were used rather briefly uh, by colonial troops, uh, mostly in Southeast Asia, and they, they had a good reputation down there. Uh, they were equipped out to second line troops. Really they, they weren't really used at all until World War I rolls around, and then every rifle in French inventory is really pretty urgently needed as uh, the losses start piling up in the fall of 1914. So uh, Kropaceks, in particular 1884s and 1885s, would be issued out to second line sorts of rear echelon troops, basically to free up Lebel rifles to go to the front. Now this would last until about late 1915. By that point uh, production of the Berthier has gotten underway, 
and, and really alleviate some of the rifle supply problem. And at that point, pretty much all the Kropaceks that are still in French inventory, the 78s, the 84s, and the 85s, a total of about 105,000 of these rifles are packed up and sent to Russia as military aid, because they're, you know, the French are under control, they don't need these, the Russians can use anything that shoots a bullet, so we'll send these all to Russia. And in large part because of that, Kropaceks, all, all three of these versions of the Kropacek are really extremely rare today. Uh, most of them went to Russia, most of them didn't survive Russia. Um, those that did survive the fighting in Russia, uh, most of those ended up back in inventory in Russia, uh, well in the Soviet Union, and then ended up getting sent to Spain as military aid uh, to the communist and socialist and anarchist groups in the Spanish Civil War. And most of those didn't survive the Spanish Civil War. The ones that did uh, mostly then went into Franco's arsenal to be sold uh, to Interarmco, uh, to Sam Cummings, and brought into the United States in the 1950s or 60s. So most of the ones you see here will actually, they'll be pretty rough, and they'll often have a stamp that says Made in France. Uh, stamped onto the top of the barrel or receiver, and that's to comply with US uh, importation law at the time, which required them to be marked with the country of origin. So uh, this one has not, uh, I don't know exactly what path this one took to get here today, uh, but it certainly did not go through World War I or the Spanish Civil War, because it is in gorgeous shape. So uh, that is the story of the 1884 French Kropacek. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, we must have if you're still sticking around uh, this long. And in fact, if you are still sticking around this far into a video on a black powder bolt action rifle like this, you should definitely go check out the Kickstarter presale for my book, Chasse to Famas, because it covers this as well as the 1878, the 1885, the conversion of the 1874 Gras into the 1885, and then a whole slew of other French rifles, uh, both before and after these, from, well, from the 1866 Chasse Poe all the way through the modernized variants of the FAMAS. So there's a ton of cool history in there, whether you are a collector looking to find out more about uh, guns you have, or looking to find out what, you know, figure out if a gun that you're looking to buy is correct or not, or if you're a military historian and just want to know more about the development of French military rifles as they've been used in every conflict from the Franco-Prussian War to modern day uh, brush fire conflicts in Central Africa. So uh, there are some really cool Kickstarter only offers and perks and reduced prices and such, so definitely go ahead check that out and uh, hopefully we'll be sending you a copy of it soon. Thanks for watching.